Chris Matis. I'm an entrepreneur from Latvia and I do business in fintech and consumer lending. My companies do over 100 million revenue per year and they're profitable. And that gives me the opportunity to once in a while do some videos on topics that are interesting to me. And today I wanted to do a topic about the Magdinsky Act. Um, uh, quite a while ago, I read a book by Bill Browder uh, called The Red Notice, and it explains how uh, Magnitsky Act was created. So I thought I'll, I'll do a whole video about it because this is a, a pretty interesting topic uh, for me. And, uh, and also it links into another video that I'm doing, which is about the current state of banking in the Baltic states. Um, the amount of AML, KYC, compliance, questions banks uh, you know impose on their clients um, and that whole situation uh, goes back a little bit to 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 the topic of Magnitsky Act and also um, uh, in the second part of this video I'll be interviewing a very special person a former member of the parliament uh, in Latvia uh, who has been working on Magnitsky Act implementation here and so we're gonna have a pretty cool conversation so Let's uh, first of all talk about uh, what the Magnitsky Act is. For those of you have, uh, who have not heard, it's basically a legislation that uh, targets... Originally it was planned and built to target uh, Russian government uh, officials and oligarchs uh, that are corrupt and stealing money and abusing human uh, rights. Mm, uh, and eventually it got mm, adapted across the world. And specifically why it's unique is because it targets uh, individuals, uh, as opposed to other sanctions, which are normally targeting uh, sectors of economy, whole countries, or or um, or companies, this one targets comp uh, specific individuals, and it's named uh, to, uh, in the honor of Sergei Magnitsky, who was a tax lawyer, uh, who effectively went to jail for just doing his job, and in jail he got uh, killed uh, by exposing corruption in in uh, in Russia. Uh, so that's a pretty wild story. Uh, so. Why I find this topic interesting, it's not that, you know, I have something to do with sanctions or corrupt Russian uh, government officials, but uh, in the meantime, I come from an ex-Soviet Union country, I do business, and so all of these stories covered in the book, or quite a few of them, in one way or another, you know, I can relate to very well. And, uh, and when I speak to friends who come from, you know, uh, purely Western uh, Europe or, or, or US, something that is far more difficult for them to to relate to but they find it very interesting and so there's a few specific topics that um uh there are a few few specific examples that are covered in these in this book and that are interesting from my own uh perspective and experience so number one is the unique mix of um we call it high finance or let's say investment banking and doing business in russia so Bill Browder was a, a big uh, investor. He was buying public companies uh, in the 90s and 2000s in Russia, exposing corruption and fighting with oligarchs and so on and so forth. Um, and I was, uh, you know, a, <laughs> um, a young analyst in an investment bank in J.P. Morgan in 2009, and I was fascinated by these stories of uh, Soros, uh, Buffett, uh, Carl Icahn, and I read books about them and so on. And, and there was this guy who was doing the cool cold investment banking shit, but he was doing that in, in, in a crazy world of corrupt Russia. So that was one one big thing that fascinated me. Second one was um, generally the exposure of doing business in Russia. So I've personally never had a business in Russia that operates there and makes money there. But uh, when I built uh, Green Finance, uh, which is now called Avafin, uh, you can get some more detail here about the company. Uh, I was raising money in the beginning from uh, people that I knew uh, from Russia and from the ex-Soviet Union. They were my first seed investors, my angel investors, and they are still my business partners to this day. Uh, some of them uh, we have very good contact with. They're great people. They're not, you know, they're not uh, government, uh, you know, crooks that have stolen money. They're, they're entrepreneurs, but having, you know, connection and relationship with these people, um, it gives me insight and knowledge of how it is to do business in Russia, right? And, uh, you know, the examples of where organized crime groups attack entrepreneurs, where they attack companies, they extort money, they, they blackmail them, and, in, and, and make life very difficult in all sorts of other ways, like, a, like an organized mafia, you know, mafia state. Um, and I know examples of a guy that um, you know, was doing uh, a business in Ukraine, uh, completely, I would say, innocent, but successful 
and his uh, company got attacked again by an organized crime group which consisted of lawyers, notaries and, and so on and so forth and uh, and they were just stealing, trying to steal money out of his bank accounts uh, and this is just something that's hard to comprehend for probably for somebody that, uh, you know, raises money for their cool idea in London or in Berlin. Alright, so that's uh, that second piece, the third one which is a funny one uh, in that second book uh, by Bill Browder called the the, um, the arrest warrant. Uh, he speaks about litigation in New York, uh, where the, the, he's fighting these uh, in, insanely rich, corrupt government officials of Russia uh, over some stolen real estate in New York. Um, and these Russians are trying to prove that they, it, it's not stolen, uh, it's not bought with stolen money. And there's this judge uh, in this uh, court in New York who is over 80 years old and he has lost almost all hearing he cannot even comprehend the arguments in the in the litigation process and interestingly finally i have gone through a litigation process in new york also uh something i uh i'm not going to jump into you know details but uh, I've, I've i've been in in a courtroom testifying and uh, talking to a super old lawyer uh, sorry super old judge so i have you know, in some ways, a similar experience I can relate to. Uh, so that was kind of another common thing. And the fourth one, lastly, why uh, Magnitsky Act is kind of more relevant than ever now, I think, and, and, and this type of topic, it's because obviously of the Ukraine war. Uh, uh, I think now for those that pay attention and for those that care, and there are not that many people, uh, you can really see what government uh, of Russia is all about. It's an organized crime, uh, you know, situation. And same like most, if not all, other uh, dictatorships uh, and these sick regimes that just that just fuck people over uh, and destroy lives. And uh, and you have this vast ocean of money sloshed, you know, out of Russia and, and similar. Uh, countries. Unfortunately, in the past, one of the gates through which this money was coming was Latvia and the banking system here. Um, and um, yeah, and it's pretty unfortunate. And, and of course, uh, sanctions like Magnitsky Act are put in place to to try to to uh, uh, punish uh, these perpetrators. Uh, so that's another interesting um, uh, commonality between my experience and, and what's written in the book. With that, I want to end my, my monologue, uh, but I want to continue with the video and speak to Lolita Chigan. Uh, she is the former member of the parliament uh, in Latvia. She has served for many years. Uh, she has worked on implementing the Magnitsky Act in, in Latvia, uh, and she has worked on man, many other major corruption uh, cases. Uh, so I'm very keen to, to have a conversation with her. But before I do, please, don't be lazy, subscribe, share, uh, comment, and uh, check out my other videos. Uh, you will make me very happy that way. All right, let's jump into the interview. Maybe uh, if we talk about this Bellingcat, can you tell more about the, the Siri trip that you had, what, 23 years ago? Uh, yes, <coughs> it was in 2000. And it was really quite amazing. I was uh, a young student. I studied in Hungary, in Budapest at that time. Did you study politics? or? or um, I'll ask about your CV in a minute. But uh. Yeah, I studied international relations and yeah. European studies. I was doing my master's there. And uh, my then boyfriend, uh, he was in a hotel business. And he won a trip uh, to Syria. Yeah. Because Syria at that time, uh, it wasn't at war yet, but uh, it was uh, authoritarian. It had very bad relations with Israel mm -hmm. and also with the U.S. So it was basically a, a bit and, of a And with pariah. Saudi Arabia or not? Probably, okay, yes. Doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. So it was a bit of a pariah state. So it wanted to embellish its uh, international image. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, they had offered the price uh, for the lottery. Uh, to have a trip uh, for uh, 10 days staying in four-star hotels and also a personal driver to travel in Syria. Nice package. Wonderful. It was <laughs> really wonderful. I was a young student and I was yeah. living on a scholarship. Yeah, so, so for me, it was just... quite a thing. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Terrific. And uh, we basically, what we did, we traveled around Syria. Uh, we went to all remarkable places, to Aleppo, uh, to the old souk of Damascus, to Palmyra. Uh, to Homs, uh, 
Um, then at the end of the uh, journey, we actually traveled to Jordan. Uh, we went to Petra. So okay. um, it w- it's, Petra it's is the, the, the desert. That's uh, the desert, yeah. the, uh, the, the canyon. Yes. Uh, the canyon, yeah, yeah, yeah. basically. Ah, the, with the, uh, the, with the, the writings city. in the walls or with script or something. Exactly. Or, yeah. It's yeah. like the sand, uh, yeah, yeah, ancient yeah, yeah, yeah. sand city. So it was just an amazing, uh, amazing trip. We went to an old uh, castle that could b- had been b- uh, built by crusaders, and mm. uh, there was a small village uh, where still the dialect that Je- uh, Jesus spoke uh, mm. was used, Aramaic. How were the people, the Syrians? Uh, Welcoming or? They were very nice. Uh, I just felt this uh, really calm and subtle uh, feeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, uh, there was a feeling that it's a militarized state mm. because they had a very big um, military budget already at that time right, because right. they were literally at the state of war with uh, the rest of the world. Uh, so it was very interesting that uh, for me as a student and also for military personnel, the discounts at every museum, at every historic site uh, were similar and were probably one third of the price. Right. So basically, this shows what were the priorities yeah, of yeah, the society. Yeah. Uh, but in general, uh, what I really liked, especially about Damascus, was that at that time it wasn't uh, too touched by the uh, development. Mm-hmm. I had been returning to Damascus afterwards because a friend of mine lived there. And sorry, Damascus is the capital? Is the capital And Aleppo of Syria. is not the capital? Aleppo is, uh, is one of the, of the cities. cities. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's an amazing uh, country. And uh, when I saw that basically uh, the U.S. President Obama, uh, first of all, uh, when uh, this uprising started and uh, Assad uh, started cracking down on the and society. And this was w- w- around what time? Uh, it you? was 2012. Yeah, yeah, okay. 2012. Yeah. Obama was elected in 2008. 2008. Yeah. It was probably a bit later, but it was definitely before Crimea annexation. Mm-hmm. So but it was well past when you were there. You were there 2000. I was there uh, in 2000. Afterwards, I returned several times to visit my friend uh-huh. who was living in Damascus. Local Syrian or? No, she is a very interesting uh, uh, person. She's actually Latvian and she had met a Kurdish poet. Oh my God. And uh, Syria has a very big uh, Kurdish community. So she lived with him in Damascus. And uh, he had two daughters. Uh, she kind of adopted the daughters and became their stepmother. So it was quite okay, a story. Okay, a whole s- s- separate story. Okay, mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. All right, and you were there back in, uh, again, in, you said 2012, around that? Or, or uh, before, before that? that. Yeah, before uh, that. It was before. I, I think I was probably there in 2008 and 2009. Mm-hmm. I was there twice because yeah. I worked in the region. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting. I definitely want to talk a bit more about that and what you think about this Bellingcat uh, book. Did you read it or not? I, uh, I've listened to the audio book. Um, ah, okay, good. Yeah, 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 it's an amazing book. Um, but maybe if we can ask, I can ask a question about your CV. I looked up videos of you, uh, which are very impressive and interesting. Uh, I looked at the uh, Wikipedia, and sometimes when I read uh, CVs of politicians, I get an impression that I cannot really follow the many projects, initiatives, and things like that that they have done, a little bit maybe because the language is, um, you know, it's in the public sector. So if I read, a, a, let's say, a CV of an entrepreneur, it's kind of, understand. I understand it, it, they created this product, this company, they exited, and it's, it kind of structures well in my head, while uh, when I read uh, you know, CVs of, of politicians, it's a bit harder because there seems like so many things are going on. If you could describe in in broad general um, phases or maybe highlights of your career, what uh, you know, what were the kind of main things that you have worked on, or or what do you think were the most important things that you've done uh, in your career as a politician? Um, probably I can uh, uh, just go a little bit a bit back in uh, in the time because before uh, the time that the, when I became a politician, I was already active in the public life right, of Latvia. Right. So the first block was uh, I was working as a journalist Mm -hmm. and I was working as a journalist for Radio Free Europe. And that is basically a U.S. um, government-funded broadcasting corporation uh, that is specifically targeted towards the former communist countries. Uh It actually started during the communism because obviously the inf- information was so suppressed, sure, sure, there was sure. nothing. No alternative. So uh, even uh, during the Soviet times, I remember that my relatives were uh, listening to Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, trying to tune in. Uh-huh. 
So um, that was my first, uh, 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 so to say, first phase of yeah. my public yeah. life. Okay. Afterwards, I worked as an uh, NGO activist and as, as a think tank uh, researcher. And uh, that was a whole uh, set of projects that I did against uh, political corruption. Mm-hmm. Because before Latvia became a member of the European Union and NATO, uh, we had very high levels of political corruption, so-called right. state sure. capture. Sure. Yeah. And then um, the organization that I worked for, we received a big grant uh, to try to work with it. And sorry, which organization? Uh, it was Soros Foundation and Transparency International. Transparency Latvia. International, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, that was after I Can finished... Can I drop in a question mm-hmm. there? Have you therefore been interested in, uh, let's say, fighting corruption and, and working on such matters right from the beginning of your career? Uh, or it kind of evolved when you started as a journalist? And why, why, why did that specific kind of area become of an interest for you? That's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, I think that I've always been interested in politics, even uh, when I was a small, a young teenager mm-hmm. growing up in the totalitarian system of so the knew Soviet you were Union. Be a politics resonated right. with me, but of course, at that time, I didn't know that there was a profession called a professional politician. Yeah. Because there was just the Communist Party, mm-hmm. and it was ugly, terrible, mm-hmm. and boring. I didn't yeah. want to be part of that. Uh, men, like, probably, mostly. I don't know. And also women, okay, like, okay. Yeah, yeah. school comrades. principals yeah, and yeah, yeah. comrades and, and all, all that stuff. So, basically, my parents couldn't give me any guidance on uh, how to express sure. it. So, uh, the first degree I did uh, was connected to learning Scandinavian languages. Because I was drawn, uh, very much drawn towards uh, the Scandinavian model of Mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. I felt that it is transparent and honest society and something that I really liked about uh, Scandinavians and uh, Swedish, especially from my naive standpoint, was that um, the communication was very simple and very understandable. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Soviet system, and also Latvia at that point, everything was very convoluted. Right. You could never read where exactly you stand. Yeah. So that somehow resonated with me. And then I started learning Scandinavian languages. And to support my studies, I, uh, I worked as a translator for Swedish organizations. And I think at that time, really, this kind of click happened. And I started interested in governance, in mm-hmm. how countries are governed. Mm-hmm. And that's probably where I started. Mm-hmm. Nice. Okay. Uh, and then in terms of if you bring it forward a little bit, uh, then uh, wherever you want to pick up again in terms of the highlights or the main projects that you worked on, is the next thing is uh, beca- becoming a member of the parliament? Or there's something still before that? There were things in between because when I started working as a journalist in Latvia, yeah. I started going to the parliament and I had to report on the government mm-hmm. affairs and I had to report on many things. And what I started feeling is that I don't, I'm don't. i out of my depth, mm. that I really don't have enough knowledge, that I see that certain things are going on, but I really don't have enough knowledge of the processes in right, the society. Right. And this gave me... But you're talking about the workings of, uh, let's say, the parliament and the, and, and the government, or you're talking about what's happening in society in broadly? Broadly, okay. uh, how new political parties were established. Also, the careers of certain people that I uh, knew or 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 uh, was an acquaintance with. Nineties yeah. in Latvia were very interesting, very dynamic, but very puzzling to mm-hmm. a young person like myself. So I decided to try to find a scholarship uh, to study uh, to do a very uh, qualitative degree. I didn't why I'd want to go to a university in Latvia because I felt that this would be a bit more of the same. Mm. So I was very actively pursuing possibilities and I studied for a year in um, uh, in Budapest, in Hungary. Right. That's when I traveled to Syria. Yeah. And afterwards I studied uh, in London at London School of Economics. I, I got I- admitted to London School of Economics as well, but I didn't have enough money to go there. <laughs> I... It was surprising. I got a very good scholarship, yeah. and I think it was because the selection committee mixed up the Balkans and the Baltics. Really? Yes, they had a very good scholarship that was uh, supposed to be for the Balkans. Yeah. 
either they did not have good candidates mm. or someone mixed it up. Mm. So I got a scholarship that was supposed to go to the Balkans. But just for the record, I just know how difficult it is to get into uh, LSC and you have to be really bright as to get the scholarship, especially not only to get into the school, but to get the scholarship. Yeah. So and, and back then, uh, because, because I was uh, applying there in 2000, 2008, nine mm -hmm. after graduating from uh, university in, in the UK, uh, and it was very tough. There was a you know big competition and so on. So I can only imagine that uh, that was some time before that. It was probably even stricter and harder. But very cool. Okay. Mm. So mm. It's, if we move on, uh, then then what happened then? Um, when do we get into the parliament? So when I returned, um, and I actually I wanted to return. Uh, it was because of personal uh, reasons, but also generally. Somehow right. I felt that I wanted to return. I started working as a public uh, policy analyst and mm -hmm. also um, director of uh, anti-corruption projects. Um, and I did that for more or less 10 years. It, that many things happened. Uh, in the meantime, I became a mother. I have two yeah. boys yeah. And, and, and so. But that was what I did for 10 years. And um, I ended up in so many scandals and so many difficult situations, very, very... Uh, much embroiled into what Latvia was at that time, but also we had some quite serious achievements. Uh, which sorry, I'm this so is before uh, the, uh, the parliament or not? This is before parliament. Okay, and of course this allowed me to build a public profile yes, in Latvia. Yes. Yeah, to be and uh, I was elected in twi uh, twenty ten. Mm -hmm. Okay, in those ten years, as you were working on all these various projects, how like can you can you um, describe in 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 the the main things that you worked on or that were most interesting or most relevant for you in those 10 years? Because as you mentioned, there were a lot of scandals uh, that you were involved in and or worked on, et cetera, et cetera. Like how would you describe to a person that doesn't know your background that much? Basically, what were the main things you worked uh, on? Uh, the, the main theme of this whole time was uh, money in politics. Mm -hmm. And Latvia is similar to uh, uh, the countries in our region and also similar to Russia. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Basically, uh, the uh, policy recipe was liberalism. Right. Liberalize everything. Yeah. Privatize everything. Stop controlling. So the, the, the opposite extreme of centralization. And Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So um, in 2000 when, uh, 2001, when I returned from London and I was offered this job, basically political finance in Latvia was completely, complete jungle. Mm -hmm. It was all over the place. It was completely unregulated. And the money that political parties were investing in politics was massive. Right. And they it was sponsored by local, by, by, by uh, private donors, interest groups. Actually, there was no way to know where right. the money was coming from. I think... A lot of money probably came from somewhere outside Latvia, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right, so that was the main objective in those 10 years. Um, then then you got elected successfully in the parliament. Can you run us through a little bit of what was uh, uh, exciting then in those eight years? or Eight years, yes, eight years. yeah. I was uh, elected three times because we had an early election. Yeah. And uh, so the, my first term was just one year. And we had an early election because uh, the parliament... Um, uh, refused to lift the immunity of one of the Latvian oligarchs mm. uh, for criminal uh, investigation. The Schlesser? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, when uh, the then president, Sattler, decided to dissolve the yeah. parliament. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, the first year was, uh, to a large extent, uh, dominated by the fact that at that time, uh, in the parliament, uh, two very strong oligarchs were elected, Schlesser and Schäle, and although I represented the party which had one uh, one third uh, of all the seats in the parliament, yeah. it was very difficult to work and to get anything done. Right, right. Then the second term uh, between uh, 2011 to 2014 mm -hmm. uh, oh. was uh, actually quite productive. I was the uh, deputy leader of the faction, mm -hmm. so I was quite influential. And we actually uh, drove through a lot of good changes. Mm -hmm. We drove through some uh, good changes for uh, the municipalities, how the municipalities function in Latvia. Uh, 
It was for the first time that we actually made restrictions for elected councillors in municipalities in how they work in uh, sorry, the uh, executive. Councillor in Latin. Councillor is like a deputy, local deputy. But what's the Latin word, councillor? Uh, 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 deputat. Yeah, okay, okay. Pašvaldības deputat. deputat. Yeah, okay. So they previously could be uh, elected mm -hmm. and also occupy any position in the executive of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. municipality. Oh, that's convenient. That's very convenient. <laughs> it's very beautiful because you make decisions, you implement, yeah, and then you uh, yeah. conduct the oversight, exactly. you control. Perfect. So, perfect. Love <laughs> it. In business, that's amazing. <laughs> that's where you want to get to. Yeah, but it was again a jungle. I ended mm -hmm. up in so embroiled in so many scandals and so, but we were just driving for yeah. force. Yeah. Then also we completed some of the uh, reforms in political uh, money that I had started. For instance, we banned political advertising on TV uh, on TV for mm -hmm. uh, 30 days before elections. Okay, yeah, I read that, remember. Yeah, and yeah. this was extremely helpful because um, senior citizens are the most uh, mobilized groups that right. go to vote. Right. And if they see some beautiful Inguna Sudraba presenting herself yeah. every night in yes. TV yeah. commercials and saying, I'm they so good, that I'll take, basic NLP, yeah. I'll take Latvia to the paradise, mm. they tend to believe. Mm. And uh, for that reason, we just kicked out that possibility for uh, a month before election. There was a lot of other uh, things that happened instead of uh, political commercials. Being on Sudrup is, uh, uh, you were on her uh, shit list, probably. Oh, big time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> big time. Okay. So that was, uh, this, uh, that was my second term. And my third term, I was the chair of the European Affairs Committee mm -hmm. in uh, the parliament. So basically, uh, I was speaking for all European uh, issues uh, in Latvia because Europe European Union has many policies. And this is a horizontal policy. It's about agri agriculture, transportation. A lot of the things that we as entrepreneurs today see as regulation coming our, uh, uh, our way yeah. actually originates in the European Union. Right, right. About 70% of national legislation now. So this um, European Affairs Committee uh, was endorsing and also controlling uh, Latvian policy towards the EU right. uh, proposals. And so you were like a translator between uh, those policies and the EU uh, versus the Latvian par the parliament in Latvia? or. Yes, being a member of parliament and uh, chairing this committee, we were kind of representatives of the society vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the EU policies. Right. So sometimes when there was something totally wrong that was proposed by the yes. EU, we would have uh, uh, business people, NGOs, activists coming to the committee and trying to, to derail it. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Mm. Okay, super interesting. Um, I'm, I'm, there are so many more questions that we can talk about, but I wanted to make sure we talk about the, the Magnitsky Act because the vid the, this video, basically, the intro I'm doing is is with my fascination about the Magnitsky Act. And the reason why I got into that topic was that I read the, the Bill Browder's book, uh, Red Notice, which came out, I don't know, years ago. And then I read the second one. And now with the war, obviously, the sanctions and uh, Russian oligarchs and all the Russian illegal money and all of this is a super relevant topic. And I just thought, like, I'll just make a video. And, and how I, I just want to make sure that's recorded, how I found out y your name related to Magnitsky Act is that I read the book and at the end of the book there are the accolades or whatever it's called, uh, where the author say thanks, says thanks to the people that were involved. <coughs> and, and I'm reading country by country because the guy was listing people that helped him with the book uh, based on uh, different countries. And I got to Latvia, and then I see the Lolit is there, and I thought, "Oh my God, I know you!" <laughs> like, that's a that's a very good coincidence. That's me. That means I need to do this video. So that's how I got to you. Um, and then you sent me some interesting. What was very interesting the um, the notes uh, or minutes from the Parliament session where they were deciding or discussing the implementation of Magnitsky Act, and that was very good, like insight kind of uh, view on how that uh, law was being thought about in, in Latvia. Can you talk about your involvement in the Magnitsky Act implementation? Um, yeah, some, some, some thoughts on that topic. Uh, yes, uh, I can uh, say that um, I got familiar with this case because of uh, the fact that I was delegated by the Latvian parliament uh, to be part of the of, um, uh, uh, Council of Europe, which, which is a human rights organization. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Russia is a member of this organization, and uh, it was sanctioned in 2014 after Crimea annexation. Yeah. But before that, it was a full-fledged member of this organization. So I was part of the delegation from Latvia uh, to this organization, and we were sitting together with including representatives of uh, the Russian parliament. Mm, very cool. And um, the general sense is that um, we who have lived in the totalitarian system, in the Soviet system, we know that these things, uh, similar to Magnitsky's story, that they are going on all the time. Yeah. All the time. That system is so abusive. Right. It's just abusing yeah. people. But uh, with Magnitsky, it was the first time that was uh, that this case was incredibly well documented, and it also had a wonderful advocate because Bill Browder. He has a very interesting uh, family story, very yeah, yeah, very yeah. complex, interesting personality. Yes. But somehow he had made a pledge to himself mm -hmm. that he will not stop until Some justice, uh, justice is done. Uh, because basically he felt that he's personally responsible for the fact that Magnitsky was killed. And um, this determination, but also American skills of communication True. and uh, persistence, uh, people in our region give up quite easily, mm -hmm. but he was so persistent. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, that's how we came into contact. We uh, met many times. Okay. And he was trying to talk we, to... We, that's with the council and uh, the brother? Uh, uh, the delegation, Latvian delegation in the Council of Europe. Okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, the Council of Europe prepared a very uh, a detailed report uh, about Magnitsky's case because it was a violation of human mm. rights. And it was very interesting to see that um, initially... Russia lobbied for some socialist members of par uh, of the uh, parliamentary assembly from Netherlands and Germany yeah. to be in charge of this report. Sure. To make sure that, that this is, is soft. Mm. But I saw how these people, and I personally knew these people, I saw how they changed. The more they uh, were going into the details of the case, the more appalled they were. Right. They themselves, yes? Absolutely. They started realizing the brutality of Russian system. Mm. So the report was very strong. And um, unfortunately, it took a long time for Latvia to impose. Sorry, and so there was a report as a result of this, um, I don't know, investigation uh, uh, by this, how do you call it, Council? Or Council or of Europe. Council of Europe. Uh, uh, and they were independently reviewing the Magnitsky case to make an independent report, and based on that report, then then what? Then the the member states had to adopt it. Adopt it. Okay. Uh, we adopted, and there were rec uh, recommendations for Russia uh, uh, to actually implement. And this report was very strong. It was uh, stop impunity uh, of Magnitsky's uh, killers. Mm -hmm. Basically, that was the title. Right. It was a very strong report. And I spoke at the debates also in the, in the assembly, and I supported some amendments, so we strongly engaged with it. And um, the and uh, sorry, in uh, just because I am completely unfamiliar unfamiliar with the process. So uh, once that report comes out, is it mandatory for all the European Union states to implement it in some form or shape, or or then it's just up to the each individual country as to what they do with that report? Yes, uh, this uh, Council of Europe, uh, it's a human rights organization. So it's basically an organization of willing. Okay. No one can force Russia right. to, to implement this. Uh, the report was very factual. It was in everyone's uh, face. The assembly voted and adopted it, but it stopped there. Mm -hmm. It didn't change Russia's behavior. Mm -hmm, sure. So Bill Browder, being this very determined individual... He understood that, per se, it's not going to change anything. Yeah. It's like a, one very good article in sure, New York exactly. Times, yeah? yeah? That further yeah. advocacy is needed. And this is when he started uh, to advocate for Magnitsky's list, uh, mm -hmm. to actually put those uh, uh, 47 individuals who were responsible for his deaths mm -hmm. uh, on sanctions lists. Mm -hmm. Because those two, uh, th these individuals who stole uh, the money from Russian yeah. uh, budget and killed Magnitsky, yeah. basically... Uh, they were using, for instance, Latvia to funnel uh, funds, to f exactly, yeah. uh, and also to buy properties, yes. uh, to obtain Schengen visas, and to travel freely and to live nice lives. So, 
That's how Bill Browder get into this uh, Magnitsky's acts. And they came to Latvia many times. Uh, he worked together with uh, Vladimir Karamorza, yeah. who is also an opposition politician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was very close to Nemtsov. He's yes. now in he prison. He was his deputy or like some second guy? Uh, Nemtsov, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, he is actually one fourth Latvian. Mm. And he got also um, attempts on his life. Oh, several. I think l- the last investigation actually suggested that he was poisoned with Novichok. Right. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Mm. Oh my God. Okay. Um, uh, and so when it gets to the Latvian parliament, like I mentioned, you sent me this link to the notes, which was like pretty interesting and it was ridiculous to read the arguments by the various uh, the Sudraba and so on politicians uh, talking about some typical Kremlin propaganda type of crap. But anyway, uh, um, can you talk about, uh, did it get implemented in Latvia? Is it enforced, this Magnitsky Act or some it adaption of it? It is enforced after yeah. 2018 right. when uh, uh, the parliament adopted uh, the sanctions list and uh, uh, gave the status of persona non, gra- non grata to these uh, 47 yes, individuals. Yes. Uh, then... Uh, the foreign ministry of Latvia immediately executed or implemented this decision. So these were granted the persona non grata status mm-hmm. immediately. Mm-hmm. But it took nine years uh, since the time when Magnitsky was killed. Okay, it took nine years from the time Magnitsky was killed. How long did it take from the time that uh, you were participating on the council and then there was this independent report versus when Latvia uh, approved the, uh, uh, the legislation? Four to five years. Oh my God, still four to five years. Yes, and I was, um, uh, in my first uh, and second term, I was not fully, I didn't fully uh, feel empowered. I didn't Mm. know how to work with these issues. At that time, I was always kind of trying to get my colleagues into doing things. And I was always trying to push and lobby them. But after some time, I realized that if I am passionate about something, I have to do it myself. Mm-hmm. And then it was very lucky that there was an active member of parliament in the Foreign Affairs Committee, and we just locked forces, and we just pushed it through. So without a kind of individual, let's say, backing for such things, for such uh, legislation, it would probably n- never would have happened, never would have been adapted, or it would have taken another five years or something? It would have taken more years. Okay, uh, that's pretty sad. Is it is it like that in other countries in, in Europe also? Uh, if, for example, do you know about Magnitsky adaption in other countries in Europe? How that went, and it was also was it tr- was it uh, kind of facing issues and 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 uh, resistance from from local parliament members? Uh, in uh, uh, both Lithuania and uh, also Estonia, it was a smoother process. So those people who uh, got the essence of the case yeah. were quicker to move mm. so latvia was almost shamed into action oh my god but um it wasn't too late we didn't right. completely yeah, yeah, lose yeah, yeah. our face but this was because of this member of uh, the foreign affairs committee mm-hmm. and also myself yeah. and a few other people right. because we just said we'll we'll just drive it through okay uh, who was pushing back um as always in latvia uh, there are several pushbacks First of all, though, there are those who are totally opposed, mm-hmm. who want to have nice relations with Russia, sure. and who said that we are Russophobes and uh, uh, don't. Who were those when, back then? On this uh, topic? We had a very uh, strong uh, Saskanya uh, um, right. faction, yeah. and also Sudraba was very much against. But very interestingly, there was a member of parliament from Saskanya who was uh, a, a part of the delegation in the, this European Council. Mm. And he had seen the report, Mm -hmm. and he had been through the debates. So basically, he was the one who was also on our camp, and he was advocating for imposing these sanctions. So we had a network of Mm -hmm. uh, of like-minded people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like there were many who said, uh, let's not provoke Russia, we need to to do business, and so. So there was this camp, and there is always, uh, Latvians are very cautious. Uh, we are afraid to create uh, big scandals. Right. We are always afraid that we would be ostracized, that we mm-hmm. would have a cyber attack, and mm-hmm. so. So there were two camps: the cautious camp and the opposing camp. Mm-hmm. The cautious camp, kind of in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Magnitsky. Um, is there anything that you are, are kind of like thinking about? Uh, uh, ah, also, sorry, one more question about the Magnitsky Act. Is it 
unique compared to other legislation that sanctions uh, individuals in that it specifically sanctions uh, individual people versus sectors or companies or, or whole economies? Or are there other legislation, other types of sanctions that go after individuals other than Magnitsky? Uh, because my understanding is that Magnitsky is strong and effective because it, it lists specific people as opposed to companies, countries, industries, and so on. Ex- exactly. Exactly. Uh, from what I recall, uh, post Crimea annexation, there were some individuals also uh, against uh, whom uh, the sanctions were implemented. Right, but not the Magnitsky. Uh, not the Magnitsky. The These were pa- parallel developments. But in general, uh, post Crimea annexation in 2014, uh, the general approach to sanctions was exactly uh, to. Um, uh, to uh, to sanction uh, transfer of knowledge, transfer of technology, yeah. uh, transfer of uh, finances, uh, to sanction uh, businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, this is what Navalny has always been talking about. He is saying that basically the West, as a collective West, the US, mm-hmm. uh, especially the United Kingdom and also sure. the European Union, we are feeding the corrupt uh, Russian business by giving safe havens Havens. to these people. Because especially London has always enjoyed Russian money. Mm -hmm. And they've been abusing London's uh, reputation, uh, also in law and public relations. They've been using the best of the best specialists to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So this was also what Navalny has always been saying, and also Karamurza and all all, all these activists. They are saying, sanction concrete individuals. Mm -hmm. And this to a very large extent in that uh, respect, Magnitsky Act was really groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. And this is part of uh, Bill Browder's genius. And I think that uh, now... The way how sanctions are thought about is much more based on individuals yeah. instead of companies. Right. Because just, I, I don't know, just expressing it in a kind of sim- simplistic terms, yes, if you ban um, exports of salmon to Russia, uh, they will start receiving their salmon from Kazakhstan. Yeah. yeah, yeah? yeah. It's always, Simple there is that. always yeah. a, w- a way to bypass. But once an oligarch is stopped at the border and is uh, thrown back, then it starts biting them. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Then, it, then it's painful. Uh, okay. Is there any other example of uh, uh, another uh, legislation or project uh, that has been very colorful that you have worked on, or difficult, or somehow uh, important for you uh, that you have worked on as part of the parliament or outside of the parliament when it comes to corruption um, that that you can think of that has also also been significant? Ah. Uh, hmm. hmm. Interesting, yes. A few others. Uh, but uh, uh, there, uh, sometimes there are, uh, 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 there are laws that you work with uh, uh, behind the scenes and mm. you never publicize it. Okay. Uh, basically, I was the parliamentary secretary of the Ministry of Finance when, when we managed to uh, pass amendments uh, to the law on credit institutions that actually... Uh, provided for the fact that the former owners of Parex Bank um, stopped uh, receiving money from uh, yeah, yeah, uh, the interest uh, or whatever. Uh, uh, because initially they had these very valuable deposits, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and yep. they were still they were still having a preference mm-hmm. in terms of yes. how the bank that was taken over and reformed by the gov- uh, by the they by, got by paid the, first. They still. got for, uh, paid first. So we included a small line Mm -hmm. saying that they will be serviced only after all the rest of liabilities Mm -hmm. is serviced. Mm -hmm. And this was very, very quiet. We did it so quietly, subtly, subtly, subtly. Can you talk about about a little bit of how that work happened behind the scenes now? Or if not, it's fine. uh, Uh, Laws are made in committees. And uh, in committees, uh, there are representatives of all political parties. So with this law, the main thing uh, was to hide this line in innocent, different setup of laws. And you know how uh, public institutions communicate with people in Latvia, yes? Right. It's very complicated. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, long yeah, yeah. letter and it's very difficult to but understand. The, but the lawyers of those two guys, they must have followed very carefully. They must have known, no? Yeah, or, but or no, they don't have that good quality mm. lawyers. And of course, if they would have uh, asked uh, uh, pa- uh, Padex owners' lawyers to yeah, look yeah, into yeah. it, if they would have signaled, then it, they would have switched on. Mm. But it was just so innocently hidden, mm-hmm. so they didn't have a gist of it. Okay. Um, 
in this kind of example, is it a case again where individual members of of the government uh, and legislative bodies need to take uh, action and initiative to make these things happen, or or was it? part of a system that produced this specific result? No, it's individual, I- individual, mm-hmm. uh, individual in- initiative. At the finance minister uh, ministry at that time, uh, uh, there was a very good expert. Uh, she is um, uh, uh, not only a very good ex- expert, but a very honest and, uh, and patriotic uh, person. Right. And she had seen this injustice mm-hmm. for many, many, uh, not for many years, but for some, some years. She saw what the amount of money goes to them still, yeah. despite the fact what they did to the Latvian economy. And so, so when I became the parliamentary secretary... Uh, she quietly addressed me and said uh, whether I would be in her team yes, to yes. kind of prepare and, and also to make sure that we submit. And also the chair of the committee, of the budget committee, uh, we were all three in agreement mm-hmm. about the tactics of how we will do this. So individual champions mm-hmm. are very important. Yeah. And uh, this is also uh, everywhere in the parliaments that what really drives change are individual champions. So uh, it's uh, also for uh, civil society, it's a very good lesson that if you want to uh, make sure that something is really implemented, you have to get involved. You, you can uh, organize a demonstration in front of the parliament, yeah. it helps. Yeah. But it's much better to, to, to try to find people who really believe in it. And yeah. for instance, I believe that we needed uh, Magnitsky's sanction list, of course. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, um, just let's switch topics a little bit, going back to this Bellingcat. Uh, I wasn't planning to uh, ask this question. Um, I found a book about Bellingcat pretty fascinating. It's basically open source investigative group of people, uh, not journalists, but activists probably, it's fair to say. And uh, it's very fascinating that there's so much information completely available online if you know where to look that really uh, can tell you what's happening in these um, uh, hotspots around the world uh, and including now in Ukraine, in in the war, etc. When we talk about media generally, can you give suggestions or let's say your view on how you consume media? What type of media do you follow uh are is there any advice for people given your extensive experience in the public sector and also working specifically for media organizations uh how do we not fall uh kind of victim to propaganda false fake fake news false information and so on and so forth as an example i would say from my side i would say like read bellingcat as an example right maybe you have some thoughts on that um, first of all, I can say that I am. I, I, I listened to the audio book, and uh, this is a fascinating book, and mm-hmm. uh, especially because there are so many cases that we've been following yeah. on the international stage, and s- many <coughs> of them have been resolved, like the poisoning of Skripals. Mm-hmm. It's completely clear how it yeah. happened, but it was actually input from Bellingcat that allowed. Uh, also, the uh, the UK investigators to yeah. to ascertain many things, and there are so many occasions when they were the first. Yeah. So uh, when the war in Ukraine started, I, for instance, found uh, one of the Bellingcat's um, uh, top figures, uh, Christo Grozev, very useful for the analysis of mm-hmm. uh, what is going on there. And of course, when it comes to the war in Ukraine, one of the huge advantages is that uh, we speak Russian and right. we can actually go back to the sources. Yeah. So uh, two main sh- sources that I used for that was uh, 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 Yuri uh, Schwetz. He is an ex-KGB officer who now lives in the uh, U.S. He has a very interesting uh, YouTube podcast. Okay. Yuri Schwetz? Yes. Okay. And... Um, he, of course, uh, what is very important is to really fully understand the the f- uh, the, uh, uh, the flavor yeah. of of <coughs> of, um, of the information uh, where these people come from, and since I know his story, yeah. I always kind of uh, double check. Yeah. But I find it very useful because he is analyzing um, what is happening in the uh, international. Uh, stage with open source media mm-hmm. reports from the US but also with his background the yes. knowledge of yes, yes, uh, Ukraine Real on the ground and yeah. also uh, Russia and uh, Russia's residentura and uh, and being an, an, an ex-KGB but you have to 
be always careful with mm-hmm. sources like that. Uh, for a long time, I was also listening to Yulia Latinina. She's from Nova Gazeta, also a very good uh, a journalist. But when she started accusing Latvia of uh, uh, being uh, stupid and not helping Ukraine and also yeah, uh, throwing kind of Dodge out, I right. kind of, because... So I uh, subscribe to Financial Times. It's an excellent, excellent, excellent newspaper. They have two very strong journalists who are based in Riga now. Max mm. Sedon. I, I read and, FT uh, also, but pr- probably yeah. more for the business. But okay. Uh, what are the I, journalists? Uh, uh, Max Sedon is the uh, uh, Russia editor in chief, uh, uh-huh. and he's based in Latvia. Okay. And there is another uh, journalist, Anastasia. I forgot. It dropped my yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, she's also based in uh, in um, in Riga, and she does very good reporting on energy. Uh, energy issues and also Russia, like Russia policy, very good reporting. Um, so what you're saying is so okay. So these are FT journalists, so, so it's the biggest established uh, media outlet. But uh, but you're saying you are also consuming information from independent uh, reporters, right? You're not. You're not. Are you? Taking your news from BBC or oh BBC of course BBC okay. World is uh, is 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 a very also yeah. a, a very good source. They basically signal a lot of things. Mm. They have good reporters and uh, specifically on Ukraine war they have been very good. So they signal what's happening and then you can uh, connect the dots. Okay, uh, interesting, cool. Uh, do, 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 do. Just a bit of a different question about uh, Latvian politics, maybe. And it could be a, it may be a bit stupid coming from kind of ignorant place. But if you had to assess the proportion of influence in the Latvian politics between Russia and the U.S., could you give a percentage of how much is effe- is is influenced and, and dictated uh, or affected by the U.S. policy versus r- Russian? Hmm, that's a very good question. Because my, and I'll I'll tell you my very uh, kind of stereotypical non-informed uh, view is that uh, we are kind of uh, um, we are uh, not on the outskirts but um, it's kind of a small town for the U.S. and the U.S. Whenever they say what we need to do, we just follow. That's kind of my um, my view. And of course, there's a uh, you know Russian uh, I don't know agents or pro-Russian uh, politicians etc. But effectively, we do what ru- what the U.S. tells us. Ah, very interesting view. Okay. Very interesting view, and I'm sure you 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 have your good reasons to think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, mm. yeah, but but just wanted to hear like h- how would you dissect that kind of a view? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would say that um, Russia's influence is strong in Latvia, uh, not so much. Because of the direct influence agency. Mm-hmm. Of course, there are direct influence uh, agency, I- I meaning persons. Yes, yes. But of course, with uh, the war now, a lot of that field is more clear. Mm-hmm. Because Who's if who? Who's exactly. Yeah. Because previously, it was very ambiguous. Many people were somewhere in the middle. Now, it's either or. Mm-hmm. So, that is that, ha- that field has been cleared up. But... What I feel is uh, what gives us um, the fact that there is still this Russia's influence and legacy is this bureaucratic way of thinking or this um, convoluted way of uh, thinking. Convoluting and sometimes dishonest way of thinking Mm -hmm. where people in uh, small power positions just abuse their power. Mm -hmm. And if uh, Magnitsky's case is big and brutal, right. in Latvia, I think on a daily basis, small and kind of much gentler cases yes, are yes. going on, mm-hmm. where there is a power abuse mm-hmm. in one way or another. Mm-hmm. So this is what kind of resembles to, to the Russian legacy. Right. And even people who are patriotic and love Latvia sometimes yes. practice that. When it comes to the U.S., it's very interesting because from my experience as a politician, I would say that um, actually the European Union has uh, a strong influence on us, really strong influence. And uh, during the Trump presidency, we were actually torn uh, between uh, the EU and uh, the U.S. because Mm -hmm. Trump was attacking Mm -hmm. the European Union. And uh, for myself... To kind of understand how it is, it's like to have uh, having two parents, 
uh, I don't know, uh, the U.S. is your father yeah. and the European Union is your mother. Because, of course, given how yeah, small yeah, yeah. we are, we need these two <laughs> strong parents. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they are kind of uh, clashing. Yeah, and you're in the middle. And you are in the middle. So this would suggest that... Uh, that influence, of course, in some sectors, one in defense sector, the U.S. is stronger. Right. But in other sectors, uh, the EU is stronger. Which ones are where the EU is stronger? Uh, in uh, in many, uh, many things, environmental standards, mm-hmm. transportation, uh, uh, foreign p- policy in mm-hmm. general. Um, basically, EU policies... They go very deep into our national uh, policies. Of course, uh, the whole uh, uh, um, recovery money development, the whole development now, for instance, if we uh, travel around Latvia, we see that we have pretty towns, Uh, many pretty towns, like Daugalpils is pretty, uh, Kuldig, clean, Mm. pretty, uh, with nice streets. This is all uh, built by uh, by European money. We never had that money to develop. And um, we have pretty decent roads. That's also all EU money. So this uh, economic motor of the EU is very, very important. But also what the EU is always a bit kind of soft about is to, and also because we are an EU member state, we Mm -hmm. we are one of the voices, is to kind of uh, push push through. Right. And in that respect, when I now work internationally, I also see that the, the U.S. diplomacy is much more pushy. Right. They are very pushy. But maybe because they can afford it more, because they're more in a position of power? Or and they or are, else? exactly, they are uh, They are unitary actor. Mm-hmm. EU consists of 27. Yeah. And yeah. for instance, yeah. Germany is always so afraid. Lagging their legs. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, of course, the U.S. is very push- pushy. You meet a uh, political officer of uh, the U.S. Uh, embassy. Mm-hmm. They are pushy. They know exactly what Kyrgyz right. and Georgians right. and Armenians, what they have to do. They know exactly who is who, and they are mm-hmm. very pushy. Interesting, interesting. If you meet, meet a political officer of the European the Com- yeah. Commission delegation, it's much more subtle. Right. Very interesting um, way to put it. Okay, that's cool. Let's talk about the last section I wanted to ask you. Uh, what are you busy working on now? What is your plan for this year? I know you're consulting uh, across different countries and organizations uh, and use your past experience to do good things. Can you talk about that? Ah, that's, uh, that, that is indeed so. Uh, so basically, I, uh, as, as I'm joking, I live locally, but I work uh, globally. Yeah. So I use my global work uh, uh, to actually finance some uh, investments uh, at home. I am running my own uh, two real estate uh, small projects mm-hmm. uh, that I want to complete this mm-hmm. year. I don't know if I will succeed because uh, there the are The objective a lot is of to make money or the objective is, uh, uh, is, is not about... Eventually, okay, yes, yeah. because uh, they are very productive assets that need to be developed. Mm-hmm. And I never had time and also uh, money to develop yeah. them. So this is what I'm doing now. And uh, it's fantastic that this uh, international work allows me to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I am uh, working, um, the scope is rather broad. Uh, Already this year I've worked with some projects, uh, but this has been from home, I haven't traveled yet. Uh, from s- for some f- projects for Kyrgyzstan, for instance, very interesting developments in Central Asia, mm-hmm. because Central Asia used to be very Russia-centered. Yeah. Uh, they used to be basically they didn't Following see anyone else, empire. just yeah. China. Uh, okay, we need Chinese money, mm-hmm. but Russia is our guiding light. Now they start to realize mm-hmm. that they have a abusive alcoholic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> crazy psycho, yeah. and they don't. They want to disentangle mm-hmm. from this crazy, uh, crazy uh, person. So they try to kind of see how they can be more, uh, uh, more, um, uh, more integrated in international yeah. organizations. And Is that coming all from the war? Did, did, did you feel the sentiment from these uh, Central Asian countries uh, away from Russia is coming after the war? Yeah. yeah. Strongly, and how how does it um, how to say um, manifest? Do, do they do, do like organizations from the government? They reach out more to to the West. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yes, there is an organization for security and cooperation in Europe, although it says in Europe, uh, it actually includes all Central Asian countries, mm-hmm. and there are more and more requests coming into that organization 
to actually help them with some yeah. governance issues. Okay, so let's talk about Kyrgyzstan. Very interesting, yeah. Uh, I think a pretty crazy country. There's a dictator or some kind of a president or whatever. Um, <coughs> is it the country where the capital is like full with white marble and and this is insane uh, stuff? I know that's Turkmenistan, okay, Ashgabat. Okay. That's a crazy place. Oh it's a God. matrix place. Okay, <laughs> okay. so <laughs> like, what exactly are you working on? If you can tell, I don't know. Uh, sure, sure. No, it's uh, it's uh, not a secret. Um, specifically for Kyrgyzstan, I was working with uh, something that sounds very boring. Uh, it's rules of procedures, uh, re- rules of procedures of the parliament. Okay. Um, for a parliament to be a meaningful body, mm. uh, where people's representatives, like myself, for eight years, uh, can express their preferences, mm-hmm. but also ma- make sure that some laws are m- passed, moving yes. and oh, passed, yeah. there needs to be a, at least some transparent procedure. If uh, everything is just a hodgepodge, you, mm-hmm. y- you, you cannot know where you can put your input. And uh, basically then, in this uh, messy situation, there is only one head of the parliament or maybe uh, leaders of the political parties who make all decisions. Mm -hmm. But to make it stronger, there is a necessity to make it a bit more transparent. Mm -hmm. And this is what they are trying to do. Okay. And so that involves talking to members of the parliament, uh, uh, or h- how does it actually look like? On, in, uh, they usually the write a draft, uh, for instance, for these procedures, where they try to describe it from their perspective, and then they turn to this organization and ask, can you help us? Is this okay? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes this organization hires me uh, as someone who has eight years of experience in the Latvian parliament, and we have this perfect combination of uh, having been uh, in, Union, in the Soviet yeah, yeah, Union, experience. but also having westernized. Mm-hmm. So I, mm-hmm. I, I've seen how these things work. And then, of course, uh, through uh, my uh, work with elections, I know also the procedures of, for instance, Lithuania and Estonia, then I can compare right. and give them right. the best input. Mm-hmm. And what is very interesting for some someone like Kyrgyzstan Examples of the Baltic, uh, I- they are very useful mm-hmm. because they feel that, okay, Germany is too far away. It's too, yeah, uh, yeah. too rich, too, 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 too developed, yes, unrealistic. Yes. But if we say, okay, in Latvia we could do this, maybe you could do it too. We're the cool Baltic brothers and sisters. That can yeah, show them the way. yeah. Okay. and that's how it works. A couple of last short questions. Have you learned or observed something new about Russia after the war started that you had not uh, realized or understood? Is, is there anything new that you see about Russia and the regime that you uh, have not kind of like concluded or observed or understood before the war started? Because there's a ton of people who obviously now understand what the fucked up place that is and, and the people there who are in power. And for them, it's a revelation. It's like, oh my God. And unfortunately, what's even worse is that there are as many or, or more people that don't care and they think it's all fine. But okay, that's a different story. But for you, is there anything new that you see like is the, you know understand the question? Mm, yeah. mm, mm. That's a very good question. Uh, actually, I have to say that uh, the most surprising thing about uh, this whole uh, development in Russia to me is that the Russian technocrats who are in charge of um, managing uh, Russia's finances mm-hmm. are actually collaborating with Putin right. and thus supporting the war. Mm-hmm. Although personally they are appalled right. because of some kind of straight patriotic duty, they feel that they have to but collaborate. Do you think it's patriotic duty or is it just that they have no way out? Maybe they are tra- feel trapped and, yeah, and yeah. so. Because basically what uh, was expected in general was that the Russian GDP would fall by uh, 15 to 30%. Yeah. It has fallen by 2.3%. And this is because of an incredible management by the Russian Central Bank. Yes. They uh, have Nab- extreme... Exactly. Thing? Her and also a few other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is just amazing that they keep doing it. So she you, were, saved you would Russia have expected the, these people to, uh, to leave the regime or uh, basically be publicly opposed to it. And, and you're surprised that they're not. Yes? Specifically those types of like the technocrats um, that you mentioned. Not that I'm as surprised, but this is just uh, deepening and reconfirming mm-hmm. that you cannot understand Russia by intellect. Right. It's just such a strange place. Yeah. And why these people, it's like it was reminding me of the Stalin time when they had these sarashkas where uh, the What's scientists, uh, it's like uh, camps 
where the scientists were imprisoned. Oh, God. If you oh, are yeah, an yeah. excellent scientist, they would imprison you mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that you would sit in this uh, sharashka and make uh, all kinds of scientific... In, uh, oh, really? I yeah. thought they just simply sent them to Gulag and they died. Oh, yeah. no, 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 no. They had the whole vision within Gulag, yeah, like to make sure that you don't sell anything. Scienti- scientist uh, prison... Um, Think tanks, yeah. Yeah, exa- exactly. And this is how I feel about the central bank. Mm. Really quite incredible. On the other, sand, uh, uh, other hand, it's like dancing with the devil. The devil gives you so many opportunities yes. for them to actually have the adrenaline of right. being able yes. to manage a situation yes. like that. It's like... What I think, I, think uh, I don't know which podcast, which interview, there was one, uh, but it was a prominent one where there was exactly, the guest was speaking exactly about that, that the guys that were are in the inner circle, the, the central bank governor, the heads of the biggest banks, you know, that are... Publicly, before that, they were very pro-Western, open culture, etc., etc. Exactly. And uh, now attended they are, Davos. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and he mentioned exactly that point that, you know, they are in a position that's completely unique and they were probably for the first couple of months driving on pure adrenaline because it was just something like nobody would ever go through in normal circumstances. Yeah. Uh, all right, all right. Uh, last question <laughs> about advice for somebody that would want to go in politics in Latvia. What would be your advice? Uh, just do it. Okay. Do it, do it, do it. Uh, because uh, basically uh, in a Im- imperfect, but still in a democratic society, if we feel that all the same people are being elected and that there is no movement in the political establishment, the responsibility is on us. Mm-hmm. It's not difficult. All you need is uh, 200 people, establish a political party, put together a list, grow your party to 500 members and just do it. Just do it. Do you think this uh, sense that, okay, if I want to change something, I have to do it personally and I, get, I have to get involved, uh, this, this sentiment has uh, uh, been now more established than, let's say, 10 years or 20 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Uh, it's becoming uh, more understandable and acceptable because for me, and my personal example is really attesting to that, uh, when I entered politics in 2010, I was this, uh, uh, so to say, the golden girl from the civil society yeah. who is always pointing out who is corrupt. Mm. And then when I entered politics, all of a sudden there was such a backlash. All of a sudden I was on the evil side. Yeah, I was yeah, almost yeah, yeah, yeah. A, <coughs> a demon. And it was really quite personally terrible because mm. I was the same person, but I was attacked really ferociously. Mm-hmm. But I think that now it has eased. Okay. It's okay to come in politics, to go, to come back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is what I really would like Latvia to be, that it's normal. You do mm-hmm. it for eight years and then you do something else. That's normal. Yeah, it's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't have to dedicate it's your not whole a life stigma. to it. Exactly. Yes. It's not a stigma for the rest of your life. That's interesting. That maybe answers kind of the way I look at it from an entrepreneur or let's say from a business co- community perspective. Nowadays, it's so easy to move abroad. It's so mobile. Uh, you can move capital. You can register companies, etc., etc. You can do business from around the world. Of course, you know, if you have the mental capacity, intelligence, upbringing, edu- education, and so on. But generally speaking, for, biz- for business people, I think most of the times it's a choice of, okay, do I stay in this country which doesn't satisfy me because of the tax, the, the various like re- legislation, etc., etc.? Banking has gotten pretty bad from one extreme to another, and I, I did another episode on this, a separate one. Uh, and then the choice is, okay, maybe I just leave to a place that is more pro-business and so on and so far, as opposed to stay and, and let's say, fight. But maybe mm-hmm. the answer is, as you mentioned, uh, you, can, you, can, you can try for a couple of years or a little bit. It's not like you have to completely drop all your business activities and your one uh, career and, 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 and do something for in, business, in uh, politics for the rest of your life. That's, uh, that maybe is, I'm kind of answering for you. I'm just thinking out loud. Um, I think it's a very good point. And I've been tempted uh, uh, several times uh, post my uh, parliamentary term to also leave and work somewhere abroad. But I've always made a decision to stay because the life in Latvia is difficult, mm. but it has a lot of flavor. Mm-hmm. And I feel that... Uh, Especially living the gray one for uh. four, four or five months. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. But there are all shades of gray. <laughs> all, like, more than 50. <laughs> That's for sure. So true. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Lolly, thanks for sharing. It Thank was amazing. You. Thanks for English. And uh, I think we're done. Thank you. Super, paldies. Paldies.